Hey guys, I'm JC and I want to welcome you to High Street Church Online. If you're new here, we'd love to get connected with you. You can go to highstreet.org slash connect. We hope you enjoy the message. Well, good morning and Merry Christmas to you all. What a great way to begin the service. I mean, you can't go wrong with kids. Aren't they awesome? Yeah, I, I, I love all the grandparents and parents that are here today to watch their kids and they did such a magnificent job. Well, you know what, this is the week of Christmas, and I don't know if you're like me, but I've heard conversations throughout this, these last few weeks that kind of go like this, hey, can you believe that Christmas is seven days away? My neighbor next door has this little sign out that says, so many days until Christmas, and, I, and I, 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 they've been gone, and so I picked up packages for them, and I noticed, yep, I guess they're gone, because that's not how many days. We're a lot closer than what they, what they uh, have listed on this sign. You know, when you're a kid, it feels like Christmas is never going to get here. Did you ever feel that way? And when you become an adult, it's like it goes faster and faster every single year. I love how Christmas is busy, and yet in some ways, we get to Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, and we slow down, and things stop, and we just spend time with family or friends. There's something beautiful about it. Some of our favorite stories are told at Christmas, times of great joy and celebration that are, are part of our story. Um, I, I think about Christmases in my life, and my all-time favorite present that I, we ever received as a kid, um, my parents told us, they, they begin to talk in code um, months before Christmas, and they would talk about the airplane. And this is how the conversation would go at the dinner table. My mom would say, Boyd, did you order the airplane? Yes, I did. Okay, when is it going to come in? And we're like, what, what in the world are they talking about? Then later on, hey, Donna, the airplane came into the store. Oh, really? When are you going to go get the airplane? And my parents were so excited about this gift that they had prepared that we got excited about it. We had no idea what it was. It was the airplane. And then finally Christmas came. And you know what it was? It was this miniature pool table. We had the best time playing pool. One of the best things about that present was that my dad is a pretty good pool player, actually. And he, he would spend time with us and teach us and show us his techniques. And the airplane turned out to be a magnificent gift. That was a Christmas to remember. Sometimes Christmas, you know, it slows us down and the, the predominant narrative of our year kind of emerges. I remember one of those Christmases was defined um, by me flying to the Philippines and coming back and I was living with my grandparents who lived in Bloomfield, Iowa. You gotta go there someday. I don't know why, but you need to. Um, <laughs> And I remember I flew into the airport in Des Moines expecting that my grandfather or my grandmother would pick me up at the airport. Des Moines is about two and a half hours away from Bloomfield. I got my luggage. I went out to the curb. I looked around. Nobody was there. I waited and I waited and nobody came. I finally decided to go in and find a phone. Back then you had to go find a phone. And I called and my grandfather was at home and he, he answered. I said, Grandpa, I'm here. He says, Eddie, I'm not going to be able to pick you up. You need to go find the Greyhound bus station and find your way back to Bloomfield. I'll pick you up at the square. Your grandmother is sick, and we have to take her to the hospital. About six or eight hours later, because those Greyhound buses don't go fast as the car, I'm telling you. I arrived. I went home. My grandmother was on the couch. That day, we took her to the hospital and she never came home again. It changed the way we would celebrate Christmas. And I know as I talk to all of you that some of you have had that experience. Someone won't be there at the table, and their absence is gonna be as profound as the presence of those who are there. How do you get through Christmas when things go like that? Um, I'll never forget Christmas of 1996. 
Cindy and I had our fifth child, James. He was born with Down syndrome. We didn't know anything about that. And then he almost died because he couldn't eat. His suck, swallow, breathe wasn't working. He was losing pounds. And when you, when you start at seven and you lose three pounds, that's a serious thing. We came back to the States, put him in cocks, and they nursed him back. And now you can see James today is a sturdy guy. He's overcome his skinniness for sure. But that was a tough Christmas because we were still adjusting to the fact that our baby boy would grow up and live with disability. And what would that look like? And how would that limit him? And would he enjoy life? And did we have what it took to be a good parent to a, a, a guy like that? And you're flying blind with most, most of these disabilities. And then you have these crazy thoughts that I have discovered are not unique to me. Will anybody want to be with our family? Because now we're going to have a child with disability. And I'll never forget Christmas time as I'm dealing with all of this stuff. I'm wondering, does God even know what's going on? Why does he let this hurt so much? Does he even care? We got a phone call from a friend of ours at the school where my children attended. And she says, hey, listen, we're getting ready for the Christmas pageant this year, and we need a baby to be baby Jesus. And I was just wondering, since I'm Mary and we're friends, if you would allow me to carry James out and let him play baby Jesus. Whoa. It was like God said to me, I do know where you are. I do know what you're going through. And your little guy, his first role ever in his history, will be the best role anyone could have. He's going to be Jesus. That was a glorious moment. It was very personal for just for them to want him. And I'll never forget the night that the pageant came and they carried him out and we were so excited that our little guy, who they had told us couldn't do very much in life and wouldn't accomplish very much, was on stage and he was Jesus. But I was not prepared for the song that they sang as they carried him out. Let me read you the lyrics. All things work for our good, though sometimes we don't see how they could. Struggles that break our heart in two sometimes blind us to the truth. Our Father knows what's best for us. His ways are not our own. So when your pathways grow dim and you just don't see him, remember you're never alone. God is too wise to be mistaken. God is too good to be unkind. So when you don't understand, when you don't see his plan, when you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. About this time, sitting in the audience, I am a blubbering guy. I'm, I'm trying to hide my tears, but they're just flowing. You know, um, of all of the stories of Christmas, John's approach to telling the story is probably the most unique. You don't actually use John if you're creating a kid's Christmas pageant or Christmas moment. You use Matthew and you, you, you use Luke. Matthew talks about Christmas from the perspective of Joseph. Man, it's a beautiful story. And Luke talks about Christmas from the perspective of Mary. Joseph is this awesome, godly man who hears from his fiancée that she's expecting a baby and it's not his. Now that's a tough thing to process. And then Joseph is going to graciously navigate his way out of this problem. But an angel comes and tells him, you know what she's telling you is the truth. 
the baby she carries is from God. Joseph, I want you to marry her, and you will be responsible to provide, protect, and you will give him a name, and this is his name. His name is Jesus. I love it. In the book of Luke, Mary is, she's, she's confronted with an angel. And the angel tells her, you know what, Mary, God has chosen you. I mean, do, do, do you remember that verse in Isaiah that nobody understands? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall, and, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Mary, you are that virgin and you have been chosen to carry the child who is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And what does Mary say? She says, behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. She agrees. And she surrenders to the plan and the will of God. And then you get to the Gospel of John. And John talks about the birth of the Son of God from a high and lofty theological point of view. I mean, you, you might have thought that John could have provided a few more details about the birth of Jesus. Because you know something about John? When Jesus was dying on the cross, and his mo Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there, Jesus says to John, John, your mother, and he says to his mother, your son, and what he does is he assigns the care of his mother, his responsibility as a firstborn child, the care of his mother. He asks John, John, I'm not going to be here. Will you take care of her as she grows old? And, and, and so Mary goes with John. I mean, they endure all kinds of persecution as the first century Christians did. Mary moves with John when he does to Ephesus. And, you know, if anybody knew probably more details than are recorded in the other Gospels about the, the, the birth of Jesus and the circumstances involved, it would have been John. I mean, can you imagine all the time they had together to sit around a dinner table and talk about, so Mary, tell me once again, what was it like? What did the angel look like when the angel came to you? Was he scary? Was he in white or blue or what? I mean, can you imagine and Mary would have shared those great details with him. And M M Mary, what was it like when you were in Bethlehem after the birth of Jesus? And one day, these magi show up. And by the way, Mary, how many were there? Now, all of us think there were three, right? You know why I think there are three? Because when I was a little boy in our manger scene, there were three. And you know, every pageant there ever was, I think, always had three. You know why? Because there are three different gifts. You've got to have three different wise men carrying three different gifts. So we all assume it was three guys and a few camels. Actually, we don't know. Some of the more great theological guys and scholars are debating about how many these magi were. But it is very likely that John had greater detail about the details of all of the stuff we talk about at Christmas. But when he writes his version of Christmas, he's already an older man. He wrote this about 70 um, A.D. or 90 A.D., like 60 years after the death of Christ. John's no longer a young man. John is an older man now. And when he thinks about all the things that have happened, when he thinks about what should be told regarding the birth of the Son of God, this is what he writes. I want to read it with you. John 1, verses 1 to 5 and 10 to 14. In the beginning was the Word. Notice the capital W. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. In another version, it'll say overcome it. 
in verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, the first thing that John talks to us about is the fact that God came to be with us. God was 100% man and 100% God. Some people think that Jesus must have been 50-50. No. He was 100-100. You can't be 50% God. Impossible. He was absolutely God in the flesh. Just a little side note of my study, not in my notes. Um, The Council of Nicaea was trying to figure out who Jesus was and what part of him was God and when he became God. And there was a guy that got up and said that Jesus was born as a man, but then later he became a God. He became God. And in all of this discussion, one of the men that were present, his name was St. Nick, Nicholas, okay? I'm not making this up. St. Nicholas heard this guy argue that Jesus was not at first God, but became God, and he got angrier and angrier and angrier in the middle of this august assembly. He couldn't take it anymore. He walks across the room and decks the guy. Now, he was put in jail. It didn't turn out so great for him. But I just love it that St. Nicholas was defending the deity of Christ. He was God. And what's so remarkable about about this God is that the God who created life and designed the entire world chose in an effort to redeem us to become a man. God, powerful, vast, eternal, transcendent, was willing to make himself small so that he could identify with us as a man and as God he could go to a cross and redeem us. I mean, this is such an incredible story. I mean, the God who created the development of fetuses in the womb chose to become a fetus and not only know about it, but experience that development. This God of heaven learned how to walk. Can you imagine? He designed human beings in the developmental process. He knew all about the development of children and how they walk. But Jesus came, and he was willing to make himself small, and he was willing to experience that. He experienced exactly what it's like to be human. Why? Because his point was this. I love you so much. I will become one of you so that I could save all of you. And Jesus came. I can't imagine how confining it must have felt for an eternal God to be a baby. There was a man who wrote his girlfriend a love letter. You actually can buy books of love letters, by the way, all of you men out there. It's possible. They're real sappy and corny and won't sound like you, but you know, if you, if, you, if you need some help, I think this guy might have had some help actually. Dear Jennifer, I love you so much I'd climb the highest mountains just to see your smile. I'd swim the deepest river infested with piranhas just for one of your kisses. I'd cross the widest sea for one of your hugs. I'd cross the burning desert just to look upon your face. With never-ending love, Frank, P.S., I'll be over to see you Wednesday if it doesn't rain. (laughs) 
You know what God said? I'm going to come to save you. And in your wildest imaginations, you will not understand the sacrifice, the commitment that it will take. But I love you this much. I remember one time at a swim meet over here at the natatorium, our, our daughters, one of our daughters were swimming. We went over to attend, Cindy and I. We, we got into the natatorium and found our way to our seat in a, a seat in the bleachers. And I looked over, and there was this other family just down the way. And uh, there were several small children. And then I noticed that one of their children were in, they, was in a wheelchair. And uh, I, you know, I, I, you know I'm, I'm in that group. You get what I'm saying? I... I notice people. And I looked over and I, I could see that this girl's disabilities were, were pretty serious and she was unable to speak and um, she had very limited movement. The only thing she ever did that seemed to communicate at all was just a little smile every now and then. And I noticed that her mother was watching the swimming competition and also her other two children who were running around. And then I noticed that her hand was in the hand of her girl in the wheelchair. There was a connection. There was a tenderness. There was that sense of just being together in the limitations that were a part of their life. Now that's real love. That's contagious. That little girl would pro apparently never be able to speak or communicate. She had to be carried from the car and put in the wheelchair, and life was clearly very complicated for them, and, and yet anyone watching could tell that for that mom, whatever hardship or limitation there would be, whatever little interaction was possible, this girl whose hand she held was her girl. You know, God in heaven was willing to limit himself as he became a baby so that he could identify it with us. He came and he dwelt among us. One of the most amazing things about Christmas is God's willingness to prove his love in such a way. Second thing that he points out here is he says that light is more powerful than darkness. Jesus was fully God and that is so important because only Jesus, he was the only man who could live a perfect and sinless life, the only one who was able to go to a cross and pay for our sin, and in his righteousness, in his perfection, he was able to exchange his death and his payment for the salvation of us. And when we call upon him, he gladly gives us that salvation. And, and, and yet John talks about this incredible light that came through Jesus, but by this time, John is an older man when he's writing the book of John, and he's experienced all kinds of hardship and persecution. I mean, right away, Stephen was martyred for his faith. The church was under attack when Saul, who later became the apostle Paul, went after the believers. He put them in jail. He tried to kill them. I mean, th then there was the, 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 the uh, efforts of the Roman government Nero hated the Christians. He would put them on stakes and burn them like torches in his garden. If you can just imagine, there was a lot of darkness that existed in the world. And John himself experienced that darkness. You know that the disciples, the disciples were martyred, every single one of them except for John. Um, they, they were martyred because of their faith in Christ. I mean, Ma Matthew um, Matthew was martyred in Ethiopia. He was killed with a sword. Mark died in Alexandria, Egypt. 
He was dragged by horses through the streets until he was dead. Luke was hanged in Greece because he was preaching. All the disciples experienced persecution. Can you imagine the level of grief and difficulty that John must have experienced throughout all of his life as his dearest friends and closest associates experienced the darkness of persecution and martyrdom? Even John himself, tradition says, was boiled in oil and miraculously survived to only then be put on the island of Patmos so that he couldn't preach to anyone else. Ironically, this is God. God on the island of Patmos reveals to him the book of Revelation. This is what, so when John says that the light shines in darkness, he knew about the darkness. But his conclusion as an older man was, but make no mistake, the darkness can never extinguish the light who is Jesus. It just can't happen. You know, the blood of the martyrs became the seeds of the church. The harder these Christians were oppressed, the more powerfully the message of Jesus was dispensed. Because light cannot, darkness cannot overcome the light. One of my favorite verses is 1 Corinthians 15, 54. Because what do we do with death? It comes to all of us. This is what you do with it. You go to the Savior whose light will prevail always. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. I'm not much in the Christmas mood this year, I'm going to have to admit to you. Because my dad is not doing so well. I don't love going into his room throughout the night and several times in the day and seeing if he's still breathing. But my dad is tough because he will rally every now and then. But I will celebrate Christmas this year believing that the darkness will never overcome the light. For those of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I'm going to tell you something. It's going to be okay. It's going to be glorious. If you were in Jesus, you cannot lose. I read the story of an MIT professor by the name of Rosalind Picard. And this is her story. As early as grade school, she was a straight-A student. I identified with being smart, she says, and I believe smart people didn't need religion. As a result, I declared myself an atheist and dismissed people who believed in God as uneducated. In high school, I babysat to earn money. One of my favorite families was a young couple, both husband, a doctor, and a wife, were really sharp. One night after paying me, they invited me to church I was stunned. People this smart actually went to church? When Sunday morning came around, I told them I had a stomachache. Eventually, the couple tried a different tact. They said, going to church is not what matters most. What matters is what you believe. Have you read the Bible? 
the doctor suggested I start with the book of Proverbs. To my surprise, Proverbs was full of wisdom. I had to pause while reading and, and think. I then read through the entire Bible. I felt this strange sense of being spoken to. I began wondering whether there really might be a God. During my freshman year in college, I reconnected with a friend who was a straight A student and a star on both the basketball court and the football field. I had never known anyone so smart and athletic, and then he invited me to church. One Sunday, the pastor got my attention when he asked, who is Lord of your life? I was intrigued. I was the captain of my ship, but was it possible that God would actually be willing to lead me? The spirit of Pascal's wager, I decided to run an experiment, believing I had much to gain but very little to lose. After praying, Jesus, I ask you to be Lord of my life. My life changed dramatically. It was as if a flat black and white existence suddenly turned full color and three-dimensional. I felt joy and freedom, but also a heightened sense of responsibility and challenge. Today, I'm a professor at the top university, MIT, in my field. I work closely with people whose lives are filled with medical struggles, people whose children are not healthy. I do not have adequate answers to explain all their suffering, but I know there is a God of unfathomable, unfathomable greatness and love who freely enters into a relationship with all who confess their sins and call upon his name. I once thought I was too smart to believe in God. Now I know I was an arrogant fool who snubbed the greatest mind in the cosmos, the author of all science, mathematics, art, and everything else that is to know. Today I walk humbly, having received the most undeserved grace. And I want us to be reminded that the miracle of Christmas is that God actually came to us. Wow. So this week, I hope you have a lot of joyful moments. I hope you have uncontrollable laughter with your families and your friends. And I pray that as you walk through your tears, when you remember your struggles, your loss, that you will remember while darkness is real, the light has come and the darkness is not able to extinguish the light of our Savior. Will you bow your heads please? You know, one of the most powerful prayers you can pray is, God, help me. Help me in my struggle. Help me in my confusion. The most important prayer you'd ever pray would be, Lord Jesus, I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. I want to follow you. I want to know you and walk with you. So today I'm going to ask you to save me if you will. If you prayed that prayer, remember the Bible says this, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's pretty simple. It's incredibly complicated. But it's so amazing. I want to ask you to stand. We're going to worship as we conclude and give you an opportunity if you would like to, to pray about something. I'm going to be down here. Um, I, I'm going to ask Bruce to come and join me. Uh, we'd love to pray for you. If you don't know the Lord as your Savior and you'd like to know how to do that, man, we're here to help you. The people at our Next Steps area, they will help you as well. Lord, thank you for what you've done for us. Now we pray that you would do a work in our hearts and carry us through the good and the bad times. And we thank you that we know that your light is winning and will win. So encourage people today. Bless them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Thank you for joining us for today's message. If you made any decision, just visit highstreet.org connect. We'll see you next week.